Hello, everyone. This is Eric Schuler with the uh, Libertarian Institute, and I'm here with Scott Horton for another round of our Q&A show. Uh, Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Eric. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Excited about uh, our Reddit page is really, uh, or subreddit, however you say these things, is really getting going. And so we have a new list of questions from folks in the group there, and we'll kind of go down. So this will be a little less thematic than some of our other shows. We're just going to kind of bounce around on what people are interested in and uh, go from there. Yeah. So this used to be the whole show feed. The interviews are on the other feed. This is all at slash show if people want to sign up for this. And we're going to do this, you know, as often as we can to try to catch yeah. up with the Q&A thing. And then, yeah, it's yep. a good deal that uh, if you want to ask your questions, uh, join up the Reddit group. we got a new Reddit group. If you're a donor of $5 a month or more at Patreon or on PayPal, et cetera, like that, then uh, you get keys to the Reddit group and hang out. We already got 55 people have signed up for it, so that's pretty good. And uh, already have a good little group in there. It's nice. Screw Twitter, man. I like Reddit. It's good. Um, but so, yeah, we got some Q&A stuff. So yeah. uh, how do you want to start, Eric? Go ahead. Well, uh, actually, let's start with the, the screw Twitter part. Um, yeah. Because I know you've been getting a lot of questions about that uh, here and everywhere else. So, you know, what's the deal with you and Twitter? You just, you know, you're kind of bummed out because they they suspended you and you taking your ball to go home or what, what's going on there? No, I don't care about that. I mean, I do like they suck. And I thought it was funny that they reacted against me the way that they did. And then you can see the screenshots on my Twitter feed right now. It's near the top that. They actually sent me an email going, oh, you know what? It was all a big misunderstanding. And uh, turns out, uh, never mind, or something like that. And they turned it back on again. Um, but so uh, the actual deal is, um, yeah, no, I guess, you know, I don't want people to think, which I guess they're going to, um, that I'm just sulking. That like, when you censored me, so I don't want to be on there anymore. But actually, that is part of why I don't want to be on there anymore. That's the same reason I quit Facebook uh, four years ago when they changed all the algorithms and stopped showing my posts to people and started demanding money uh, to show my post to people. I just said, well, screw you and switch to Twitter. And Twitter's pretty much the same way. And so I notice um, that, you know, it says I have 18,000 something followers. It sure doesn't seem like it when it goes to um, or even, you know, what they claim is in the engagement of who saw what that I tweeted. Uh, when all my tweets and retweets are in the tens, almost always, very rarely do my my likes get into the hundreds or whatever on there. So, um, and then the feed is more and more just whining garbage. So the, you know, signal to noise ratio, if you want to put it that way, is just so out of control now. And I keep thinking of that book Technopoly by Neil Postman and how, you know, this Twitter is the end of education. You know, it is... Um, it's making me stupid. It's making me less productive and it's, um, it's, uh, making me less of a show host and less of an editor, less of a director of the Libertarian Institute, less of an editor of antiwar.com, uh, less of everything I'm really supposed to be working on. And so, you know, I guess I may figure out how to get my, uh, entries to push to Twitter or something like that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, I just spent way too much time and just not getting nearly the bang for the buck on there. I really have to question why I'm on there. Um, you know, I, that makes uh, sense. I, I can't really, and I guess some people can just use Twitter, but I abuse it. You know, it's time for me to quit. And so when the, when the Twitter pigs kick me off of there over calling Jonathan cats, cats on earth, a boohoo little bitch, um, then uh, I thought, great, you know, this is exactly the clean break I've been trying to make, so to speak, and they're giving me a good opportunity. So once I got it turned back on, I put out a couple tweets to show that, okay, well, I won. I didn't hit their stupid button, but they restored my account anyway. But now I'm really trying to get some books read, and I'm almost done now with uh, We Meant Well. Can you believe it? I'm finally reading We Meant Well after all this time by Peter Van Buren, and I'm also almost done with... Um, the uh, Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg that I've been trying to get knocked out for half a year here or something that's been sitting here collecting dust, which is really great. And everybody ought to read it if you want to know how you're going to die, how we're all going to die. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So, yeah, I'm really getting back to that. And I'm doing a lot more reading of articles and a lot less, uh, you know, with, with Twitter out of my way. I'm getting a lot more read. And uh, so it should be to everyone's benefit. They like but don't you think you're going to... You're going to miss out on all those honest, you know, 
discussions that you could have with followers on Twitter. Well, maybe not followers, but just randoms on Twitter, changing minds and yeah, all not those. really. <laughs> yeah, I really think you know probably as editor of antiwar dot com, I can do better. Um, you know, trying to actually. Uh, call together some things that matter and put them up there where other people can tweet, but have something to tweet about, you know, I don't know. Yep. And also the Libertarian nah. Institute, you know, I started the Institute. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I said this before, cause it's true. I just wanted to figure out a way to try to pay Will Grigg and I don't make any money either, you know, but it'd be nice if we could make a little bit of money. And especially if I could figure out a way to get Will Grigg paid. And then we thought, well, of course, Sheldon Richmond would be a great third guy there. And uh, got Jared LaBelle to come in and help us run the thing. And, um, well, help nothing, I mean, to run the thing. And um, so, uh, but also we created it right when I was in the, right in the middle of writing my book. Like, I just finished the first draft, basically, and was stopping to read 20 books. So, uh, you know, it was a really stupid time to create an institute, <laughs> uh, basically. And then, oh, poor old Will died. Which is still unbelievable to me. Um, I'm getting somewhat used to the idea, but anyway. Um, so Will is gone, and you know the institute. We've got some great writers at the website there. Of course, you know the heroic Sheldon Richmond uh, pulling weight for all of us um, in the whole movement. I mean, not just the, at the institute uh, with all of his great essays. And then we've got you know Craig Cantoni and. Uh, Zach Sorensen and quite a few other great writers. Kyle, of course, and Will Porter put out great stuff and um, got Mance Raider and all this now. So, you know, the, the site is great, but I'd like to make it into something even a little more than just a site. I really would like to make a thing out of it. We've got a 501c3 and a c4 and a this and that. And Jared is a real go-getter when it comes to, you know, activist type stuff. So there's a pretty wide open future for the Libertarian Institute. You know, I think people... Um, you know, I hate to put it this way, but they seem to be more excited about it than it deserves to have them be, uh, such as it is right now. But that goes to show, I guess, it, you know, people really want to see something great out of it. And um, so I really want to put more work into that. Twitter's really getting in the way of that, too. I mean, I really just, it's like a giant distraction. It's like a, a something buzzing in my ear that I can't get away from kind of thing. So... I think, you know, maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> but I like to think that uh, that having Twitter out of my way will, you know, help me do better on antiwar.com and the Libertarian Institute and, and also for the show to get back to making the show more about interviews with authors of books and get into real in-depth good stuff. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I, um, yeah, I know anytime I spend an uh, extended period of time on Twitter or Facebook arguing with people, it's just... You, you never feel good, but you're just like, ah, oh, what did, where did those hours go? Nothing, nothing useful was ever accomplished. You just feel angry, more angry at the world when you get done. Right. Um, yeah. So I guess, uh, that actually leads us pretty well into our, our next question, which is, um, comes from, well, actually, I, I don't know if they, people want their names. So I'll just, uh, say it's from one of the users in the Reddit group. And, uh, he asks, what are the best ways of which listeners can work to limit the war state and its atrocities? So we know it's not Twitter, but um, what, are you, what are your kind of thoughts on that? Is it, is it just voting? Is it calling? Is it, you know, personal persuasion of people we know? What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I really don't know. Um, <laughs> this is my best idea, man, and it's not good enough. You know, I mean, I'm trying kind of, but, um, you know, uh, I guess whatever is, you know, within in your world, the place where you can reach the most people, um, you know, have have your arguments straight, of course, and then, you know, uh, a friend of mine told me a long time ago, most people don't deal in facts, they deal in impressions, and so what you really want to do is just leave people with an impression, and so on one hand, they could have the impression that, well, he talks about that a lot. You know, or they could have the impression that, you know, he makes a pretty good point, even if they kind of don't remember the point later. But something along the lines of like, yeah, you know, that anti-war guy seemed to actually kind of have his act together and whatever, despite what I saw at the football game the other day about how much I'm supposed to never question this. Um, you know, I mean, if if you can find a way to to break through to people's minds, the the more the better, I guess, is my thing. 
I mean, I like I look at it. I learned this in in school, um, in social psychology, attitude inoculation, uh, which is like a scam, like how to get you to, um, uh, like they give you a weak argument and then. Uh, so you defend a position that you only just took for the first time, but you defended against a weak argument. And now you believe it stronger. Anyway, I just like the, I like the idea of the inoculation. So, you know, mine isn't exactly the same as that, but it's just, you know, knowing that every time that they're trying to start a fight with some foreign country, you know, that's all America's fault. You know that they lie every time. Just look at what they've done. There are no exceptions. You know, from David Koresh to Saddam Hussein to Muammar Gaddafi and Bashar al-Assad and every one of these guys to Vladimir Putin, they just come up with, ooh, hate that guy, fear that guy, believe everything we say about that guy, and if you don't, then you're a chump and everybody's laughing at you because we all believe it. And they just do the same thing every time. And so at some point, people should just know that, okay, I'm, that's not going to work on me this time. I don't care. You know, your so-called, uh, you know, peer pressure or whatever to to get on these bandwagons and go along with this. I've seen this before, man. What you're doing to Trump now is the same thing you did to Saddam. You know, it's just CIA making leaks, putting them in the post. And the next we go to war, <laughs> you know, it's a little bit oversimplified, but it pretty much works like that. So, yeah. You know, it seems like if if someone is, and everybody knows it by now, right? Like, it, you don't have to be a libertarian or any kind of paleo right winger or leftist uh, part of a, the liberal spectrum over there to see this stuff. Like, you could just be somebody's mom and be like, you know, it seems like they're always trying to make us afraid. You know, I saw a clip of Bill Burr uh, from quite a few years ago where he's saying, uh, or um, may have been Norm Macdonald. I've been watching some Bill Burr and Norm Macdonald too since I'm off Twitter. But uh, it was one of them anyway. I think, oh, I think it was Norm. And he's going, you know, they're always trying to go, ooh, North Korea. And I'm just wondering, like, is that scary any of y'all? Because, you know, and he was talking, kind of mocking the idea. Like, I'm trying to go to sleep at night and I'm thinking that the North Koreans are going to get me. It just doesn't really sound right, you know? Uh, it doesn't feel right. Does that feel right to you? You know, we're supposed to be scared of Korea, the poor side of Korea, you know? Um, so anyway, I mean, that's my only thing is just trying to get people to, you know, shrug and admit that, okay, I don't really believe in this stuff. Or I guess I got to recognize now that, you know, it's not just a matter of, you know, the the left versus the right or the the uh, wimps versus the tough guys on what must be done. You know, that it's actually all smart people are against this stuff now, you know? We've been through enough. Right. We've seen enough examples of this now that it shouldn't work on us at all anymore, you know? So to you, a big part of it is kind of convincing people to have their default position not be trust the government because, you know, a lot of Americans identify, you know, government and country as all the same thing. And so it's sort of part of their own personal identity. They're like, oh, it, I'm American. The American government must be trustworthy because I'm trustworthy and we're all in this together. Right. But really for you, it's it's convincing people that the the prior position is be skeptical of people with power because they have power and that's they tend to abuse it. Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be that much of a stretch to go, OK, but like what if Barack Obama was the one doing this same thing? How would you be for it then? You know, or right. or or the other way, you know, Um I saw a thing where 43% of Republicans think Trump should have the power to shut down any media he doesn't like. Guys, really? We're only two years out from when the literal Antichrist was in charge of the government for eight years. The Kenyan secret Islamist terrorist takeover. Uh, that's the same authority you would be leaving Trump's Democratic successor. You know, they can't even think that hard about it, you know? But there's some principles yeah. you don't want to violate because what about when that same power falls into the hands of people you don't like? You know, um, and and look at that. People who look the other way when Barack Obama's killing American citizens with CIA drones and signing the NDAA to lock people in detention camps under military, you know, accusation only. Um now find that they gave that power to Trump. And actually, they're not bothered by it because it seems like their biggest complaint is that he won't use that power to take on our enemy, Russia, which just goes to show what a tool of the Russians he is. And so that's kind of ruined their whole uh, what could be a useful take from them. 
Well, plus the noble CIA is running things, thankfully, so they don't have too much to worry about all that executive power getting out of control. Because yeah, thank God. We all know Brennan and company are in charge, even if he's out of the out of the uh, executive branch nominally. Yeah. Um, and even the Gina so, Haspel thing is like, hey, this lady's the torturer. She belongs in prison. Instead, she's the head of the CIA, which on one hand, you could be ironical and say, yeah, that's why she's the perfect director for the CIA is because what a monster she is. Which, you know, it is fitting if the glove fits and all that. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, it, it sort of makes it seem like, yeah, Trump put that mean old kind of Republican torture lady in there, and that's bad. But otherwise, the CIA is great. They're here to protect us from the elected president, <laughs> you know, yeah. no matter no matter who he is. I mean, you got to admit, and I hate Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and Barack Obama is better, better than anybody, I would say. You know, like, I'm really good at it. Um, but uh, I can't say I would have wanted to see the CIA get rid of them for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's kind of not progress. That's something else going on. Yeah. There you are with that consistency again, supporting opposing coups here and abroad, Scott. That's yeah, not and make it and of both parties, you know. As much as I hate these guys, and seriously, like my burning contempt for Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, especially, and I hate Barack Obama too, out of principle, but I don't feel it the way I do for Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. Those bastards, Jesus Christ! Don't get me started. But anyway, I still. You know, they sort of kind of won elections, you know, Bill Clinton only with pluralities and George Bush. Yeah, he kind of stole both of them. But whatever. Anyway, it's still better than the cops and the spies who, you know, have no limit on their secret authority whatsoever intervening. You know what I mean? I'll still take a Bush over a Brennan anytime. And they don't even theoretically have accountability at the ballot box either. There's not going to be a... But, you know, and all other things being equal, of course, I would just get rid of it all. But that's not what I'm talking about. Right. So um, another thing here, maybe we'll talk about the political action piece um, that he asked about specifically, you know, voting, calling your congressman. uh, I think that stuff can be useful, man. Yeah. So the last one first, um, uh, Kate Kaiser, um, you were bringing this up before we went on, um, was about – the, the lady from the Friends Committee, uh, that's the Quakers, the Friends Committee for National Legislation, and they focus on nuclear weapons stuff and all kinds of great peace stuff, and they're really consistent and great um, religious pacifists. And, um, but, you know, they do really solid activism. And um, so, yeah, it was Kate Kaiser who was saying, listen, it really matters. You know, I kind of pitched to the softball. I don't know, man. You know, it seems like this is just... Um, you know, waste of time and effort. They don't care about us. They don't care what we, sh- what we say. And she says, that's just not right. I mean, if their phones are really ringing and ringing and ringing, and, they, and the staff goes, wow, people are really complaining about Yemen today. I don't know what celebrity said something or something, but apparently this is a big deal all of a sudden that the congressman gets to know that, and it does have an effect. And, you know, that it, it could be a marginal effect, but sometimes that's all it takes. And sometimes people got a lot more power than they think they do. You know, it's kind of like the argument about campaign finance reform and all that. It's kind of crazy when you have billionaires who can afford to finance elections in a way that sort of renders our votes moot. Um, We're just kind of the rubber stamp after the fact, after they've done all the choosing and that kind of thing. But if you ever had a campaign finance law to fix it... Of course, it'd just be like McCain-Feingold, where they prevent you from running ads, from you know regular people throwing together these nonprofit groups or these uh, you know um, political action committees to run ads within 60 days of the election. The only people who are allowed to run ads are the Republican and the Democrat in the race. This kind of thing, and so you know it's good that the court struck that down. What we should have is have it totally deregulated, where that would really be our best hope: is all us thousandaires pitching in a little bit. And, you know, not even necessarily to run campaigns, but even just to oppose incumbents, you know, that kind right. of thing. And really trash these guys for what they do and hold them accountable. At the end of the day, everybody's an individual. At the end of the day, just, you know, public choice theory, there is no national interest. There's only the interests of the people with power. And so, you know, if you want to stop them, you got to make them afraid. And I know that sounds stupid, like I'm saying have faith and vote harder or whatever as, you know. 
anarcho-capitalists like to mock. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, you know, all these are marginal activities, right? Like economically speaking, we're, you're trying to move the line over a bit um, uh, to see, you know, and, and maybe move it a lot if you have a chance to. All other things being equal, and, and we can argue um, for, and we should always argue for, you know, total statelessness, total separation of government and society. That's the way I see it. Get rid of them all. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we can argue on particular points in a way and participate in the system in ways that, you know, not to cloud our judgment and make us think that this is the path toward freedom but it, there are things that we can do in terms of participating in in parties whether in you know uh third parties or inside the party systems look at all the damage ron paul did for liberty um uh, by being a republican and in fact just toiling away in you know uh obscurity you know he had his hardcore fans watching c-span in the middle of the night watch him give a house speech to an empty chamber and uh, nobody else cared until 2008, and it became the biggest deal in the world and got Mises and Rothbard read by millions more people, you know? So, um, yeah, I would say be creative, man. You know, get in there and do it. And, and, you know, always remember Horton's Law. If you can, attack the right from the right and the left from the left. So if you're arguing with conservatives, you know, you don't have to just straight up call them hypocrites and invoke, you know, beat them over the head with Sermon on the Mount quotes or whatever, you know, but but explain about, you know, how government really is, you know, in all cases, it exists to serve itself. And so if you hire them to abolish poverty, they'll make more poverty because if they solved it, not that they really could, but if they even could, whatever difference they could make, they're making themselves obsolete, putting themselves out of business. And they don't like to do that. <laughs> and so it's the same thing with the military. I mean, imagine the same government that we want to have their you know, filthy hands out of our this, that and the other policy in this country. We're going to send those same people to remake Afghanistan, you know, um, Harry Brown used to say the military is just the post office, but with M-16s, you know, just look at the way they waged war. Reading We Meant Well by Peter Van Buren. Oh, check out all our great projects. We're going to make this new chicken factory. We're going to make this new milk factory. We're going to come up with this new garbage collection system. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. None of it goes anywhere. All of it's just ridiculous. Make work. Nothing. They never go out of business. They only fail upwards. They only, you know, it's a self-licking ice cream cone and all that. And then, you know, get them on sound money and inflation, the boom and the bust cycle and the Federal Reserve. And how are we supposed to have sound money? How are we supposed to ever get rid of the IRS? We live in a country where if you earn money, that's a crime. And you are forced to confess, and then you will be assessed a penalty. The more you earn, the more they're going to fine you for earning money. That's our tax system in the United States of America. That is insane. That is absolutely It is intolerable that this goes on for one more minute. How is anyone... This is like... I don't, I really, it's as bad as the war on Yemen. It's the worst thing in the world. And we put up with it. It's incredible. But how can we ever get rid of it as long as we're at war? And, you know, the warmongers will even say, well, come on, we need to have a central bank because what if there's a war? Yeah, exactly. That's why we need to not have a central bank. So you guys can't have these wars anymore, you know, and yeah. so attack them from the right. You know, um, and, you know, who's the big government liberal now, Mr. Sociology class, with your big project of how to remake Mesopotamia? We see what happens when we let you try, you know? Right. Well, and, and you know, you, you took on the right there um, at this point, yeah. you know, after eight years of um, President Obama making more cool again. Uh, you, you want to weigh in on how you'd attack the left from the left, too? Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I mean, I don't know if any of them have really adopted pro-war lines very much. They just learned to not care under Obama. Maybe, you know, try to rationalize it. Well, he's trying to go after al-Qaeda terrorists or whatever. But if you know anything about that, he took al-Qaeda's side in Yemen, Libya, and Syria. So don't give me that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. And it ought to be, I mean, seriously, if you're anti-war at all, you ought to be able to, you know, 
basically just crack a whip and force any liberal to admit that you're right and and line up with you on that. That like, come on, there's enough new left, you know, understanding of power left over from the Vietnam and Nixon years. That people have got to remember, you know, the permanent war, the these generals, the CIA, and these, you know, this war system. This is not the, you know, what they, you know, really believe is the American way and the way things are supposed to be. You know, Rachel Maddow wants to get them all hyped up for preserving the NATO order. I mean, how bad are they really feeling that? You know what I mean? They don't really know what it is. To the degree that they do, they think it's probably dangerous and they're right. So... You know, well, okay. I, I think you're right. They, on they're that, no but what good. About... They're no good for opposing, but they're not much of war supporters. You know, they can't. They're not really reliable. I, and I don't mean the people with power in D.C. I mean, their voters and supporters yeah. and just liberal people out in the world. I just maybe I'm really being naive here, but I think that they're pretty damn lazy when it comes to being behind this kind of thing. Well, I mean, but there is that the responsibility protect idea of. You know, well, this time in Libya, you know, we're taking the side of the Arab Spring. We're we're it's the one time U.S. foreign policy is going to be, well, at least recent years, going to be taking the side of the little guy and helping out. And I, I think that's the line you would get to the extent that you get one from. Yeah, you know, but I mean, rank and file. I think voters. that's a great example, right? Where you know, the liberal warmongers and the CNAS crowd and everybody in Washington D.C., the Democratic Party, sure, but the. The liberal people of America, not really, you know, I mean, the the poll at the time was 90 something percent opposed and six percent for it. And, you know, you had in, in Republican districts led by, you know, Matt Drudge and Breitbart, all of talk radio, all of right wing talk radio was against it. Um and that was and that was all Libya the Republican too, districts. And then the liberals, I mean, what did they have? They had, you know, um, you know, NPR and I guess Democracy Now carrying water for Obama on starting that thing. But that was not much. And I don't think they had much lockstep support, you know, among liberal. It's not like moveon.org was or I don't know, maybe they were, but I sure don't remember like some big push by the Democrat grassroots to get behind that. You know what I mean? It was more mm-hmm. like, OK, Obama, if you want to, we'll look the other way. But right. Got it. Okay. You know. So, yeah, and and but in other words, I mean, so I mean if the question more specifically is his question about how do you talk to people like that, well, just tell them. Look at what we're talking about, man. We're talking about uh, you know, the generals and the CIA and wars for empire. We're talking about corruption on a vast scale. You know, uh this is uh I stole this from William S. Lind years ago where he said, uh, you know, the right wing very embarrassingly right-wing paleocon William S. Lind, uh, war strategist. Uh, he said, this is the biggest honeypot in the history of the world. The defense budget, like what, what progressive could get behind that system? You know, a trillion dollars spent on global conquest. Is that really what you believe in? Just because they told you that Trump doesn't or something? Come on, like how far is that really going to go? This is not right. You're not for this. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And which, by the way, that brings up another thing. A guy emailed me and said he never hears me talk about the military industrial complex and the arms industry as being the motive for the war. And I just kind of I was actually in a hurry and kind of gave him a flip answer and just said, you're kidding. Right. Come on. We talk about this all the time. Um, but the thing is, I actually owe him a little bit better answer than that, I guess. A part of it is. You know, of course, like I just said, it is the biggest honeypot in the history of the world. And that most, you know, much of that money goes to banks and to uh, big arms firms. You know, the banks service the national debt, of course, and make all this money off of government bonds and all that. And they also, um, of course, make a cut on every transaction. Whenever, you know, Lockheed cashes a government check, you know, Citigroup gets their cut of that and whatever. And, you know, a zillion here and a zillion there. And pretty soon you're talking about some serious money from these guys. And then, of course, all these arms firms led by Lockheed, numero uno, but then Boeing and Raytheon and General Dynamics and a thousand more, um, you know, maybe more than that, this huge number of firms. And then for that matter, um, 
you know, the universities. They get all this money for research and development on all kinds of different, you know, weapons and technical systems and education for officers and God knows what. You know, they're building a whole new a complex for you know some militarist studies here at ut austin now at the cost of a jillion dollars you know um and all this kind of thing and so uh you know it's a huge system it's a huge uh network now my thing is that i don't put that first because i don't think it comes first i think at the end of the day the empire is ruled by the state the state are the enforcers the executive branch and you know the congress are there basically for the appropriation of the money uh to put their rubber stamp on it and keep it all under the pretension of the old constitutional government but then the national security state is really you know the joint staff and the uh the chairman the top generals and admirals and the cia and the state department guys who you know have their own ways of you know their own plan their own consensus about the way things are supposed to be and for their own benefit first so you know are are is general dynamics do they push like oh yeah we definitely got to stay in afghanistan or whatever yeah but are they somehow holding a gun to petraeus's head and saying listen despite your you know better judgment we need you to do this for us anyway dave no <laughs> that's not it you know they support what he's doing and he's happy to do it you know happy to die trying happy to get other people killed failing to uh, you know, expand wars that he knows cannot be wrapped up with anything like what they call success, uh, short of victory, even. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know, the arms firms are a big part of it, and of course, this does come up all the time on the show in all of the coverage of the uh, F thirty five and the F twenty two before that, and all my coverage of the nuclear weapons, and then anytime we talk about the think tanks. Um, from the Project for a New American Century to the Center for a New American Security and everything in between. All of those things are Northrop Grumman project, uh, projects. Uh, I have a whole chapter on this in my book, Fool's Errand, and uh, yeah, so et cetera. It's not that I uh, discount that. And I think, you know what, actually, I really follow Gareth Porter's lead on this. And Gareth Porter is a leftist, and um, and yet he doesn't you know, focus on the corporations being behind it all. Cause that's not it. You know, they're part of it all. It's a huge part of it all. Um, and you know, of course I kind of left out, but I shouldn't have, you know, all the generals and admirals when they retire, they get jobs on those board of directors where they really get to cash in uh, pay back for all their hard work for the man while they're in there and that kind of deal. But anyway, Gareth still says, Hey, at the end of the day, the decisions are being made by military guys. You know, I mentioned Daniel Ellsberg's book, um, the doomsday machine about the nuclear weapons, um, you know, uh, policies inside the government. And that's not all a bunch of contractors running around, which they do lobby for overall hawkish policies and that kind of thing. Don't get me wrong. They lobby for their brand, uh, you know, their contract to build the nukes. But in terms of, you know, who controls the nuclear weapons policy inside the military, they're not taking a bunch of corporate interests into account. You know what I mean? They are the state. They are the center of their own empire. And, you know, they do it their way. And for them, you think it's more, is it their own institutional interest primarily, or is it, you know, well, it's gray always, on a chessboard? Yeah. Right, it's individual and, and institutional. And, you know, uh, Daniel Ellsberg is, you know, one of the great ones to read on this. His previous book, Secrets, um, about uh, the Pentagon Papers and Vietnam is like this, but the Doomsday Machine, too, where he really emphasizes that all this talk about no one in D.C. can keep a secret and Anything that's actually true and matters will end up on the front page of the New York Times and all that. How that is just not true. I mean, the law is they will put you in prison for a long time for leaking these secrets and for the people inside and depending on the kind of secret that you're talking about. But when it's sources and methods about spying on the Russians and, you know, nuclear weapons policies and war plans and that kind of thing that, um, you know, you have tens of thousands of people who will keep secrets. He talks about he estimates, you know, in 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 his in the book Secrets, um, he uh, estimates that I think forty thousand people must have known that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a hoax, and they kept it. They all kept it secret. 
And there were people, you know, on the outside who kind of knew right away and whatever. There were, you know, so-called conspiracy theories about it all along. But in terms of confirming that any of that was true, everybody kept their mouth shut. Tens of thousands of people let that go because they weren't going to be the one to stick their neck out. And then, you know, for for a whole lot of things, he talks a lot about that, how important it is, the way that they keep secrets and how seriously they take it. And the level of secrets that they keep, and particularly when you're talking about omnicide, as he puts it, nuclear war. Yeah. Okay, I, uh, I think we did a good job answering that. Um, yeah, then we'll move on to uh, to another question here. So uh, another one from the Reddit page. Uh, what are your thoughts on U.S.-Turkey relations? So it's kind of open-ended, but what do you think about that? You know, I really don't know. Honestly, um, I mean, I know there's new sanctions on Turkey. And, you know, Erdogan has threatened to arrest American officers at the Insterlich Air Base over there. Hang on. I'm going to drink some Dr. Pepper. Um, so, um, you know, but do the Americans really want to push the Turks so hard that they just end up in Russia's camp? Um, I mean, I'm not saying I care. Um, is there anything that they can even do about that? You know, I don't know. Um, the Turks, um, I'm trying to remember what they said about the bogus Saudi proposal for the, for the peace deal. I know the Jordanians said no for the Palestine, uh, pseudo peace deal there made to fail. Ridiculous thing. Forget, um, what it was that Erdogan had said about that. Um, but, man, you know what? I've had such trouble keeping up with the state of things. I know he still has troops on the ground in Syria there um, protecting the uh, <laughs> al-Nusra fighters left in Idlib province. Um, he, For a time, he certainly was using them uh, in attacks against the Kurds at Afrin only just a few months back. Um, so... Uh, you know, I don't really know the state of that, and I don't know whether the Americans care. I mean, it was a CIA project under Obama for a very long time there. and um, With the Turks' help, right? Yeah, with the Turks' help. Were... <clears throat> and now, you know, the Turks, the Saudis, the Qataris, they all had their own favorites and their own, you know, things going on during that. Um, but, yeah, you know, I really, um, I really should catch up. Eric Margulies is always a good one on this. Uh, Elijah Magnier, you know, I'm a little bit behind on reading his blog. I just read a great one about, uh, the fall of a body there, uh, in Iraq. Um, but yeah, I should probably catch up with him and, and Patrick Coburn. I don't know if Patrick Coburn's written about Turkey lately. I need to catch up on Patrick's latest pieces too, but, um, I think he's been kind of taking it slow for the last couple of months. Um, but anyway, yeah, I definitely need to catch up on that. Um, it's hard to keep it all straight and, you know, cause the alliances keep shifting too, but you know, it's kind of hard to tell how serious the splits are. I mean, sometimes, um, you know, I guess it was reported that, uh, you had the Turks taking off to fight in support of the Al Qaeda groups on the ground, uh, and the Americans taking off both from the Insulik air base to go off in support of the Kurds against them. And so, you know, like, are they just joking and it's just some scene yeah. out of Catch-22 over there? Or like, this is deadly serious and they're really staring each other down across the tarmac? Or, you know, what's the scene yeah. during that? You know, I don't know. interesting dynamic at that base. Yeah, man. Well, and, it, you know, they got American nukes there. Supposedly there's H-bombs sitting there. Um, I don't know if the Americans are really keeping them quote unquote safe or if the Turks ever really had would have a motive to seize them or allow them to be seized. But um anyway. And and most of American sorties out like in Syria and maybe in Iraq too, are they they're mostly flown from Inserlik, right? So that so it seems hard to believe that the US would be willing to well, would do anything that would jeopardize that if that's that vital to them. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean I have no idea what they even okay. claim are their red lines. And, you know, I I imagine that American relations with Erdogan behind the scenes stay pretty solid, even as they seem more tumultuous on the surface. 
That'd be my guess. Okay. All right. So moving on, another question. Um, can you give a, ba- a summary of the history of the war in Yemen from the drone wars to today? Yeah, I can do this pretty fast now, I think. I've been repeating myself a lot lately. So it starts with Barack Obama in 2009. In the fall of 2009, he started the CIA drone war there. And it was, you might remember, it was Christmas Day 2009 that the underpants bomber tried to bomb the plane over Detroit. Um, and that, had, that was about six weeks after the bombing, <clears throat> after the CIA bombing had started in South Yemen. So now all that ever did was grow Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula because they killed innocent people, women and children, uh, you know, bomb funerals and weddings and the typical kind of thing, and including bombed the guy who was the most powerful tribal leader on the ground who was rallying all the different tribes against Al-Qaeda at the time, dropped a bomb right on his head because he was meeting with some Al-Qaeda guys telling them leave town or else, and they bombed that meeting. And this is the kind of ham-handed crap that you get from the that kind of drone war anyway, these so-called surgical strikes. Uh, that are nothing of the kind. Um, and so all that did was grow Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Now, at the same time, Obama was giving guns and money to Abdullah Saleh, who was the dictator. And so Yemen, if you look at it, it's you know it runs mostly laying what you would consider like more or less horizontally from east to west. Obviously, the whole Arabian Peninsula is tilted up to the northwest. We're talking about the southwest corner there. Um, so really, when I say the country's divided north and south, it's really more like east and west. I mean, it's kind of a bend in the line. But the far east is mostly desert. Um, there's you know some inhabited places out there, but a lot of that is just desert. And then in the west of the country, that's divided. You, know, you can see it more of, as like a north and south divide there. So anyway, the capital city, Sana, is right around in the middle. And uh, Aden, of course, is down in the south and Hodeida on the Red Sea. So anyways, sorry, I'm supposed to be going fast. No, you're fine. So Sala rules the capital city of Sana, right around in the middle of the country in the, on the western side, but in the middle, uh, north versus south kind of. And... So he's actually playing a double game because he's back in Al-Qaeda and they're friends in the Muslim Brotherhood because he's using them to fight against the Houthis. And he keeps sending his army and these Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda type groups up to fight against the Houthis. Well, each time he does that, he loses. And the Houthis get more and more powerful. So the Houthis, this is a political designation. They're made up of Zaidi Shia and they come out of the far north of the country up near the Saudi border there. And they defeated Saul's forces four or five times and got more and more powerful all along. So then their spring breaks out a couple of years into this in 2011. And so into 2012, there's an assassination, I think two different assassination attempts against Saleh, and but one of them he's wounded. And so while he's out recuperating, they go ahead and push him out of power. Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State under Obama, his first one, and um, and the Saudis work together to push him out and replace him with a guy named Mansoor Hadi, H-A-D-I. So he was the vice president, but he had no real popular support. None of the no none of the people who pushed for Saleh to leave had really supported him to be the replacement. And they, this was kind of forced on them. And in fact, if you just Google Hadi and put it in Google Images, you'll see the one the ballot with one name and one picture on the ballot during his election that Hillary Clinton said was the advent of Yemeni democracy. And this is, you know, the way that U.S. and Saudi handled the Arab Spring in Yemen, such as they did. Well, so Hadi had no support, and the Houthis came. Oh, and Saleh, when he left, said fine, and took his armies with him. And so, like much of the army, maybe, you know, depending on who you believe, maybe most of the army went with Saleh. And then guess what? He went and joined up with the Houthis that he'd fought all those battles against up in the north. It turned out he's a Zaidi Shia, was a Zaidi Shia, uh, although not a Houthi. But so he had enough in common with them to make an alliance there and eventually come and march on the capital city of Sanaa and take it over in the spring of 2015. Now, Obama's on tape 
admitting that the the Iranians, who are the Houthis' friends, not really their allies or backers or anything like in the hyperbole in the news all the time, um, but you know they have a relationship there. And the Iranians warn the Houthis not to take the capital city because you're going to drive the Saudis nuts and they're going to start a war probably over it. And the Houthis didn't listen to the Iranians and they went ahead and in alliance with Saleh, captured the capital city. And then the Saudis did, in fact, launch this war. And this is the war that America, you know, the, the other half of the war or, or the other side of the war that America's backing. And so uh, the U.S., of course, supplies all the planes, all the bombs. American contractors do all the care and feeding and maintenance on the jets and the weapons inside Saudi. American spies help them pick their targets and help with, you know, intelligence and coordination in the Saudi war room and all that. American, um, you know, uh, I forgot exactly what they're called, uh, just tankers, I guess, the, those Boeing tankers, refuel the Saudi jets um, on their way to their targets in midair refueling. And the U.S. Navy helps enforce the blockade. That's been now three and a half years <clears throat> enforced on this terribly poor country, uh, preventing any food, any commercial traffic, only humanitarian traffic really gets in there. Um, and uh, in a policy to try to starve the people out. And the United Arab Emirates, the United Arab Emirates is on the ground with their army and um, with mercenary forces, and they've taken the south of the country, uh, including the port of Aden. And, you know, there's just a, got a little background noise from me there, Eric. Um, um, and uh, the... Uh, the AP just reported the other day, and you know we've had all these reports of the UAE torturing prisoners, um, you know, rotating them on barbecue spits and all this, um, and sexual torture and God knows what. And then the AP had another story just the other day about how the Saudis and the UAE are making deals with Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula on the ground there and integrating them into their forces, and that the Americans are going along with this. Again, just like in Syria, committing treason and literally supporting Al Qaeda, literally supporting the guy sworn loyal to Ayman al Zawahiri in order to supposedly check the power of Iran, which is hardly even part of this story, except in the propaganda. And of course, you know, all the hairdos on TV will just say, oh, I mean, if they ever were to mention it at all, certainly in the written media, it's the Iranian backed Houthis, the Iranian backed Houthis. But they never really have to explain that. And there's just a couple of accusations of ships being intercepted with Iranian weapons on them. And they're both debunked by the great Gareth Porter. One of them was a ship that was leaving Yemen on its way to Somalia because even at war, they're exporting guns. That's how lousy with guns the society is. It's like Texas. They don't need iran to arm them they <laughs> got rifles already and uh and you know the uh nikki haley did her big speech in front of a missile and said that this had come from iran but then jane's defense weekly the you know the highly respected trade magazine for the arms industry um they said no iran and yemen bought these from north korea at the same time way back years ago and so um you know, all of that is just a giant inflated excuse for war. And now, on the political side, Mohammed bin Salman, who was, at that time, three and a half years ago, he was the 29-year-old, brand new deputy crown prince and defense minister. And now he's the crown prince. And I don't know how much of a role this really played in solidifying his power. But part of this was him launching a war, and Patrick Coburn wrote about this at the time, Part of this was him launching a war for his own political needs to bolster his credibility and standing as the defense minister inside the country. And then later, you know, shortly after that, he led this purge against all his cousins and uncles and um, basically set himself up to succeed his father, who's ailing and dying and, you know, soon to be out of the way. Um, and so Mohammed bin Salman had his own purpose in launching the war there. And then the Obama administration, I like to put this out there for people to check my work, that this is how cynical these guys are. You know, Obama famously, according to Robert Gates, and this seemed credible to me anyway, Obama said that his decision to launch the war in Libya was 51 to 49. 
51 to 49. In other words, he's admitting he didn't have to do it. Just like Iraq, it's what they call a war of choice. Or what anyone else on earth would call aggressive war. Just like America outlawed after World War II. <laughs> right? Except when we do it. Um, so... 5149. So same thing here. Is Obama said, look, we have to placate the Saudis. We have no real interest in doing this other than to make the, the Saudis less mad at us for signing the Iran nuclear deal. And so to placate them, we'll launch this war, which even they said at the time to the New York Times that they knew that this meant the war that they were launching would be long, bloody, and indeterminate. But they did it anyway. Uh, indeterminate. Right? They didn't have even a set of goals that they could even pretend to check off a list within some certain amount of time or anything. Just, okay, I guess we'll see what happens. 51-49 kind of thing. And just launched the war. And, you know, and this is a thing where, according to the UN, 50,000 children have died of deprivation. Where, you know, according to Nasser Arabi, a reporter in Sana that I talk to regularly, he estimates between 50 and 70,000 people killed in these airstrikes. Uh, which I don't doubt. And they have deliberately targeted the waterworks, the electricity, marketplaces, funerals, weddings, uh, you know, businesses of all kinds. They bombed the marketplace with a school bus going through it the other day that killed 50 children and injured another 80 people, also mostly children, who were coming home from summer camp. Because they were, you know, in a marketplace that the Americans and Saudis were bombing. And again, against Al-Qaeda's worst enemies in the country, the Houthis. And by the way, I should I should add as part of the story that Salah's dead because, you know, I used to joke, if you go back a year ago, you could find me joking that, you know, it shouldn't even be a joke. I don't know. That, well, look, if Salah was backed by America and Saudi all that time, and he's now got an alliance with the Houthis who, that, you know, basically rule the the capital city and everything to the north of it anyway. Um, well, how about we just compromise and put Salah back on the throne then? If, you know, if it would stop a war, it's hardly democracy for the people of Yemen. But if it would stop the war, how about the Houthis and the Saudis compromise on Salah? Well, that was what Salah tried to do. Only, instead of going to the Houthis and saying, hey, here's what I'm going to try to do... He tried to backstab them and just go and turn to the Saudis and say, Saudis, help put me back on the throne and I'll screw the Houthis out of power for you. And so the Houthis killed him. And that happened last December. So he, he kind of took half my advice, but he blew it. And <laughs> so that didn't work out. So now he's gone. But the Houthis still rule the place. And the war, you know, continues on. There's supposed to be... Um, you know, some talks coming up or something. There's the UN has, uh, you know, appointed a new guy, Griffiths, to to try to lead the talks on this, but they don't seem to be going anywhere so far. And I guess I should add too that domestic, you know, bipartisan uh, politics plays a, a really bad role here because Obama started the war and Trump doubled it or, you know, continued it by, you know, expanded it. Um, and well, on and both he's had sides. those very high-profile uh, seals raids there, where I think that right. was his first State of the Union, or I'm not sure if it was formal State of the Union, where he, you know, had everybody give a standing applause, but it was just, you know, some Navy SEAL who did a botched raid in Yemen, which is like, you know, I mean, that guy's just he, well, he's following orders to his death, but it, it's implementing a policy that's horrible. Yeah, and, and killing civilians, including yeah. Anwar Alaki's, you know, young girl, uh, young daughter. Yeah. Um, in one of those. And so that's the special operations guys on the ground joining the CIA war against Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Well, most of the wars being fought for them, um, yeah. you know, against the Houthis is the much worse uh, part of the war here. And and so Obama started it and Trump's continued it. So neither side wants to take responsibility that their side did it, too. But it's still bad and we should still stop it uh, or be a hypocrite and just try to blame the other guy and get away with that. When they're both so guilty. So for Trump supporters and for Obama supporters, they all kind of have this extra partisan reason to overlook this thing. And the media has been silent. You know, this is it's funny because we just shrug, you know, depending if you're like me, I'm cynical and hateful enough now that, you know, I'm hardly shocked. But I should be right. Like 
It's it's criminal. It's just the worst thing in the world that MSNBC didn't cover the war in Yemen not once, not one story in a full year, not one. You know, and um, I mean, just think about that. How many shows do they do about Russia, 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 and you know Donald Trump cheated on his wife and whatever crap, over and over and over again, and. And never cover the war in Yemen once. And then if they did, it would all be about, you know, can Donald Trump succeed on the war our hero Obama started or whatever, you know, is probably their take. Um, You know, so it's like, we don't even want that. Ooh, Iran is in Yemen. What are we going to do about it? Donald Trump is taking his orders from Putin tonight, you know, whatever. So, um... You know, I don't know, man. It's, It's really bad, though. You know, when you think about the ratio of the cruelty of this war to the amount of anybody gives a damn, it's really not fair. <laughs> you know? People ought to at least care and and be helpless and frustrated that they can't do anything about it, but they ought to at least care. They ought to at least know. It's really yeah. wrong that people don't even have to be aware of what is going on on their dime. You know? Blowing little kids apart with high explosives. And, yeah, and for such a shallow, you know, for foreign policy reason too. Of, yeah, for nothing. Well, we just want to not rock the boat, so we'll murder a lot of people, and it'll be fine. It'll be good. Yeah, and you know, speaking of you know, and placating the Saudis over the Iran deal. So the Iran uh, nuclear program was always a civilian safeguarded program. They always were members of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and they always had a safeguards agreement, and all of their nuclear material was locked down and inspected, no problem. But everybody pretended like it was still a problem anyway. Um, and so badly that we almost went to war over it a few different times. So the deal was, Obama said, look, we are going to take this issue off the table. You know, Iran, uh, Iran's nuclear program, we are going to limit it so bad and open up inspections so bad that this cannot be an excuse for war anymore. Give me a medal for preventing an Iranian bomb that they weren't even making, right? So uh, it was really an unnecessary thing and yet necessary anyway. Um, that's the real context to that. But so the Saudis, they weren't grateful that, oh, thank goodness you've protected us from Iran's nuclear weapons program by making sure that now it's simply a civilian one. Well, um, that's because there was no threat in the first place. So, you know, that was basically a scam all along. So why would they be very relieved when they weren't really upset? But what did upset them was the idea that this issue was out of the way. And that now maybe Obama is going to lead the United States in tilting back toward Iran and away from Saudi Arabia. And that it would threaten their place in our international order over there. And so, you know, I think that was part of the Saudi motive for doing this, was making sure that, you know, you're not tilting back toward them. We're going to put you to work on our side again right now to make sure that, which that was a completely unrealistic fear on their part. Obama was had no motive to do that, had no intention of doing that, and couldn't have gotten away with it and wouldn't have tried, even if he wanted to. Um, you know, such as the power of the lobby in D.C. There's no way in the world he would have done that. His whole The whole context of the nuclear deal is that we're not bringing up all these other issues because we won't get anywhere with them, you know. Because we don't want to, really. We'd rather keep the Cold War on. We just want to ratchet the temperature down a few degrees, kind of. That's all. But anyway, so that was, I think, part of the reason that the Saudis wanted the war. Was because of the nuclear deal, which on the face of it secured their interests. Protected them from the possibility of an Iranian nuclear bomb. Yeah. Well, and and I guess the other thing they're concerned about, to the extent that it's a their concern about international relations is that by unshackling the Iranian economy, then their, you know, their regional rival is very likely to over, well, I don't know if overtake them, but would be grow in prominence in the region. And so, although them starting a useless war in Yemen doesn't really solve that problem other than everybody knows Saudi's doing things. They're just bad things. Right. And in fact, if anything, they've proven what a paper tiger their military force is. You know, if they really got into a tangle with Iran... You know, apparently they couldn't do it. They couldn't fight without the U.S. helping them do the whole thing. Which, by the way, too, uh, some I forgot to say before, is according to Nasser Arabi, this reporter, and I believe him, that the people in Yemen, they call this the American-Saudi war. They're not fooled at all. They know that this whole thing is an American op, that it could not happen without the USA. 
So, you know, get real. We're the empire. Saudi's the satellite. And they have a lot of influence. And, you know, the economy of, of Saudi and Israeli influence over the American government is incredible, you know. Uh, and yet, at the end of the day, it's guys on this side uh, who could call this off. Donald Trump could call this off without even lifting a pen. He could just say out loud, turn off this Yemen war right now, and it would be over. It's all he would have to do. All the power is on the American side. And look, I mean, they're going nowhere. There's no victory in sight here. They're not going to put Hadi back on the throne there. It doesn't look to me like the Saudis and the UAE are ever going to be able to take the capital city from the Houthis. Um, you know, they can starve the people out, but the fighters will still have enough to eat to keep fighting. At the end of the day, that's the way these things go. Uh, so, and and it is, it really is a policy of deliberately attempting to inflict a, inflict a famine on these people. Of doing it. of may, I don't know if they're out at, at outright famine, but there's certainly, people are dying of starvation there. I don't know how many it has to be before it's a famine. But uh, they are... You know, it is absolutely a siege warfare. It's really bad. I mean, imagine the propaganda if Russia or Iran were doing this to anybody. You know, if the Russians were doing this to some group of Mongolian tribesmen out in Siberia somewhere. Or what? I don't know. Uh, if anyone anywhere in the world that wasn't under the American thumb was doing this to somebody else. What if the Palestinians were doing this to the Israelis? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, put the shoe to, on that foot. <laughs> tough to imagine that counterfactual, but uh, the U.S. would certainly be bombing them by now. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, it, or even just if, uh, and and it is less, even if the roles were reversed between the Israelis and the Palestinians for a minute, Yemen aside, if if it was right. the Israeli Jews who were all rounded up in the Gaza concentration camp, getting bombed by. Uh, by Palestinian F-16 fighter bombers or whatever their equivalent. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that would last about a day. Um, That's true. Anyway, all right. Um, so what do you want to talk so, about next? Ukraine? Um, well, actually, there's one other question here, and we are getting close to an hour, and I know we don't want yeah. uh, to make this so hurry. long I'm that people sorry. I'm really bad at hurrying. No, you're fine. Uh, one question here. When are you going to write Fool's Errand 2 about uh, Iraq Wars 1 and through three and a half. You know, I really don't want to. Um, Are there books you could recommend instead for that sort of narrative? Um, no. Um, I mean, I, there are a lot of books about Iraq, but you kind of, none of them are what you're looking for. You just got to read a whole bunch of them and get it yourself kind of thing. Um, you know, the problem is with writing a book is it's really hard. And... Um, you know, it took me basically a year to knock that thing out and then another half a year to do the audio book and get it good, get it all edited and put together. And um, uh, what a pain, man. I just, God dang, um, I, I really don't want to do it anymore. I'm really a lot better. It's Well, it's a lot easier for me to do it this way. And you know what? Like, I, I do have an idea that if... Um, if I could get a good enough ghostwriter, and I have someone in mind, I just, you know, we need to talk and work it out. But if I had a good enough ghostwriter, I have, you know, presentations that I've done that are basically what I want to say. You know, if I had, you could have somebody else write it all out for me and basically be in charge of getting all the comma splices right in the first place and all that kind of deal that I don't have to worry about. And, and you know, I just had maybe basically the the book almost written and I would just have to really finish fleshing it out kind of thing somehow that maybe I could do it that way. But, um, but no immediate plans. Yeah. And you know, the Sounds problem like is too, is I got really bogged down and uh, you know, fool's Aaron was supposed to be chapter two of the book about the terror war. And it became this giant thing just to talk about Afghanistan. Cause you know how I am just like in my Yemen answer there where <laughs> It's way too much, man. Yeah. So, but I, what I really want to do though is just have a very kind of brief thing where, like, the Yemen chapter would basically be what I just told you, like a transcript of that, only edited tight. But basically, mm -hmm. this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Doesn't that sound familiar? And then do the same thing about Somalia and do the same thing about Libya and Syria and just, you know, 
how support for al-Nusra led to the rise of the Islamic State, and then how Iraq War III led us to our current standoff with Iran and Syria and whatever crap, how whichever way we go from here. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's all. I think it's easy enough to do if you can keep me from writing it. You know what I mean? If I write it, it's gonna I'm gonna get so bogged down in these details again, get all broke on on the off the plot and off the narrative and to the facts too much, you know? And then maybe I could even say, here's a great bibliography, and here's, if you want to read Fool's Air, and that'll prove to you that I can really cite all my sources if I need to, but in this case, if I could just tell the story without having to cite all my sources and get bogged down and all that, um, I think that could be okay, man, kind of an overview. That was what this book was supposed to be. Me and Tom Woods were going to write it together, actually, was how it was going to be. And it was going to be like kind of very brief. And I was going to send him all these kind of notes and then he was going to write it and it was going to be good. And then I swear, man, my original outline for that Afghan chapter was very brief. <laughs> I just <laughs> kind of. Yeah. yeah. Just didn't didn't wind up that way. That's all right. Turned out to be something different, but but good. Um, yeah, but I, I yeah. don't want to do that again. If I could figure out a way to really do it in the in the most kind of brief, just you know, summary kind of a fashion to get you to understand the most important points about it without having to name all the neocons, but at least name the Kagans and them. I don't know. Richard okay. Pearl. All right. So we'll, we'll move on. We'll probably do uh, two more kind of quick ones and then uh, we'll probably wrap up and finish up the, uh, the other questions we have in our next one next week. So, uh, one question we had was, uh, you interviewed somebody recently about the history of Russia that kind of walks through, um, how everything goes. Somebody just wanted to know who that, who that oh, was. Yeah, in that best thread, on that? You know, I was wondering if maybe he was thinking of James Carden from the, uh, center for East West Accord, the committee for East West Accord. Um, I'm pretty sure that might have been where we talked to kind of a lot in about the 1990s in Strobe Talbot and he had read Strobe Talbot's memoirs and he talked about how Bill Clinton said to Strobe Talbot, but George Kennan was your mentor and he's saying, don't do this. And then Talbot writes in his memoirs. And then I said to Bill, oh, don't worry about Kennan. He just never really liked NATO anyway. Like, God, is that really the level that these people discuss this stuff? George Kennan never really liked it, huh? Well, how comes that? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? George Kennan is the godfather of containment. You know? Yeah. Um, anyway. Strobe Talbot. That bastard. Everything in the world is Strobe Talbot's fault. Get used to saying that, you know, as you're digging through your nuclear wasteland. Searching okay. for scraps of rotting flesh from something cooked, you know, half cooked with gamma rays out there. All right, thanks a lot, Strobe Talbot. <laughs> All right, so we'll we'll stick with James Carden for that one. Uh, so then, moving on to Ukraine, no, wait a minute. Similar as long oh, as wait. I got Strobe got Talbot, oh, okay. <laughs> as long as I got Strobe Talbot, I've said this on the interview show. People might have heard this. It came up in an interview the other day, actually. So there's this article and it's got a lot of bad stuff in it so if you really don't know your ass from your elbow maybe don't read it because it might confuse you there's a bunch of garbage in it but maybe you'll be able to tell um but it's still a very interesting read it was in the new york times magazine a few months ago and it's called like the quiet americans behind the russia policy oh god you know um the quiet whatever like it's some stupid drama um and anyway um, so it's about the Russia hands and, you know, Strobe Talbot and NATO expansion and how, you know, geez, maybe America did pick this fight with Russia after all kind of thing, you know, as close as you can get to that for the New York times magazine. And so, uh, well, I'll do the whole quote here cause it's really just, you know, him kind of excusing himself at the beginning. He says, hey, if the leadership of any country has any view but the following, it's not going to be the leadership of that country for very long. And that is, what can we do in our own interest? And then it says, but the NATO question Talbot admitted was complicated. And then this is the fun part. 
Should we have had a higher, wiser concept of our real interests that would require us to hold back on what many people would say is our own current interest? In other words, I have a very high time preference here, and for my own good, I think of what he's saying. Is it just like out of a libertarian accusation, right? For my own position in the government, if I don't do everything I can to put my government in an advantageous position in the most immediate faction, I will lose out. I won't be the leader, I won't be in the leadership of that country for very long, he says. And then, so that mindset necessitates what? It necessitates the short-term advantage gained in expanding America's NATO military alliance to Russia's borders. At the expense of what he calls our real interests. (laughs) A.K.A. our long-term interests of staying out of a nuclear war with Russia. And so that's it. That's what he's saying. So the first part is just his excuse. I would have got fired if I didn't do it this way. But now, looking back on it, should I have thought about our long-term interest of maintaining a friendly relationship with Russia and put that ahead of our short-term interest at the time, which was what? Polish votes in Illinois and, you know... Selling F-16s. A nod from, yeah, a, a nod from Lockheed for some think tank money and some good press in the run-up to the 96 election, you know, this kind of thing, in the run-up to, to 2000 with Al Gore running. And so, there you have it, right out of the horse's mouth. Public choice, you know, libertarian economic analysis of bureaucratic politics in its crystalline essence right there. Strobe Talbot thought it would be good for him and for Bill Clinton to do this. And now he admits that, geez, maybe our, quote, real interest would be different than what he calls... The current interest back then. In other words, short term versus long term. And of course, you know, um, self-interested, you know, selfish for them, for their own narrow interests at the expense of the most important thing in the world for all of mankind, which is keeping those H-bombs in their silos no matter what until they're taken apart, (laughs) you know. And and that's that's the evil of politics right there. That's not an argument for anarchy. I don't know what is. It's just crazy, man. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a great quote? It sounds kind of low key, you know. I understand it doesn't sound exciting when I read it. Like long term interest, short term interest, current interest. What's he talking about? He's talking about picking a fight with Russia after we won. We won the Cold yeah. War. Now we're all supposed to be pals and stuff, you know? But <laughs> Well, I like how he says, like, should we have had a wiser view? Like, no, no, no. Never have the wiser view. Right. That's a terrible idea. No one wants to be wise around here. This is politics. Yeah. A higher, <laughs> wiser concept of our real interests <laughs> yeah, that would great. require us to hold back on taking the full advantage of the situation. <laughs> so there you go. It is. That's Bill Clinton's college roommate at Oxford in their Rhodes Scholarship days. And uh, yeah. and that's who got us all killed. Meet the G that killed me. Strobe Talbot. I <laughs> like that. It's <laughs> um, a public enemy okay. reference for you old people. So we'll we'll pivot to one country one country west to for our last question here. Uh, so this comes again from our um, from the Reddit thread. Uh, we're asking about uh, Ray McGovern said that the 2014 Ukraine coup was retaliation by the neocons um, against Putin for getting Assad to hand over uh, his chemical weapons and avert mm-hmm. that war. And sounds like something that could be plausible. But he, he was uh, um, he's asking, you know, is there solid evidence for that or is that kind of speculative or what, what can we say about that? I would say at certainly. best it's speculative, yeah. But, okay. you know, the best source that you want to read, though, you'll have to Google real hard and find, you know, um, because this came up a few different times, so it may be difficult to find the very best take on it. But the guy you're looking for is Robert Perry. 
and he was really great on what was going on in Syria and Ukraine. Um, and, uh, yeah, boy, is he missed already. Big time, that guy. Um, but uh, so he really kind of had the timeline and a couple of pretty good quotes, I think, about how frustrated these neocons were that Putin had prevented the basically regime change breaking out in Syria over the first Al-Qaeda false flag sarin attack in uh, August of 2013. And what Putin had done was really, it seemed like he, he and Obama worked this out behind Kerry's back, even, that what we're going to do is we're going to get all the chemical weapons out of there, and that'll be how you save face. And they took the, you know, it was the uh, UN Chemical Weapons Organization that oversaw the exfiltration of all the chemical weapons, and they took them to an American ship floating in the Mediterranean Sea, which disposed of them, which I hope doesn't mean just dumped them in the damn sea but somehow incinerated these chemical weapons in a safe way. <laughs> We're supposed to believe anyway. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but they got it was the Americans and the U.N. that got rid of the chemical weapons. And this is how Obama avoided because he really trapped himself into that whole stupid red line thing. And I think he knew it. Now, you know, the Hirsch article has him saying to the uh, I guess not to Erdogan, but to one of Erdogan's guys at dinner that we know what you're doing in Syria and it's going to stop. And yeah, so look at me. I'm not eating dinner with you at all. And he turns around and leaves kind of thing. Um, and, you know, confronted them about that. That was him confronting them about doing the false flag with Al-Qaeda there. Um, and so... And this is uh, that same red line and the rat line Yeah, article. the red line and the rat line piece. Um, and so... Um, uh, like right after that then... And I think that Perry had a couple of quotes... From people who, you know, were right all involved in hawking it up on Syria right then, who were then really disappointed and kind of turned right around and said, well, Ukraine then, you know, or something like that, you know, where they're looking for a way to kind of, you know, pr do everything they could to prevent this, uh, you know, working relationship with uh, between Putin and Obama because of course another part of this was they were working on the Iran deal and Obama needed Putin to be cooperative so that he would help pressure the Iranians to work on the the coming Iran deal and so that was also why the neocons wanted to intervene against that relationship and do what they could to mess it up and so a part of that I think really was escalating in Ukraine now at the same time though you know I don't really want to you know, I'm not sure if maybe Perry kind of skips the part where, you know, there's no real evidence that Obama was against this at all. And in fact, in the leaked phone call of uh, Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt, and Victoria Newland is Robert Kagan's wife, and she was the Deputy Secretary of State for European Affairs, which is basically the ambassador to the EU. And the Russians, obviously, but not provenly, um, leaked a phone call of her and Jeffrey Pyatt plotting the coup and talking all about what they were going to do and how they wanted this guy to be outside of the government still and they wanted this guy to be the new prime minister and here's how it's supposed to all work and they're tired of the of the Germans and the EU they're taking too long to uh you know get everybody to agree on the next step and so um, we're sending this guy in from the UN and uh and we have uh, vice president Biden is also, you know, basically the last guy in line to invoke, to, to bring in, to make sure to, as they say, midwife this thing and solidify it before Putin can shoot it down. And this kind of talk is the way they put it um, to do the coup there, which ended up taking place just a couple of weeks later, right on schedule. They were already caught. They did it anyway. Um <laughs> In, uh, in February of 2014, which led, of course, to the war and uh, the conflict, such as it was, over uh, Crimea, etc. So, um, you know, I, I wish I had, uh, I guess I can't say I really uh, know that Perry was right about that. I mean, it was just as plausible as anything. I mean, the fact is the neocons are horrible on all Israel-related issues, meaning... They're happy to see Al Qaeda win as long as it's against Hezbollah and Iran and their friends in the the Baathist uh, state, the Alawite uh, dictatorship there in uh, Syria, and uh, and they're horrible on Russia. And so, if that means supporting Nazis in Ukraine, hey, you got to do what you got to do. 
that's the way that they look at it. Um, so I don't know if Ukraine really needed to be the revenge for Syria. I'm sure they would have taken every advantage they could have anyway. But I think Perry, you know, he certainly has a case that they were motivated. You know, they were more motivated. Like, we really have to do something to thwart Obama's working relationship with Putin here. You know, for all the people yelling treason about Donald Trump now, thank God that Putin and Obama got along as well as they did on some things anyway. You know, a lot of that could have been a lot worse. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Right. Um, you know, Obama did eventually back down on putting the anti-missile missiles in Poland and the radar station in the Czech Republic. And he didn't have to do that. That's the famous leaked uh, overheard microphone uh, spying on them, or maybe it was just an accident, um, when he's telling Medvedev, wait till I get reelected, and then I can climb down on that man, and it'll be all right, you know? That's not the exact words, but that's basically the deal. And people go, oh my God, look at him agreeing to back down, and whatever, and it's like, yeah, thank God. Isn't that great? That he was telling Medvedev, tell Putin I'm not doing the anti-missile missiles in Poland, okay, bro? All right, cool. That's exactly what I want to hear from any president. You know, that was absolutely the right thing, you know. I, and next thing you know, Trump's going to do that to try to prove that what a Russian agent he's not. And he can't placate these guys. He keeps taking all these. Uh, he's just putting new sanctions on in the name of the Skipral poisoning. I mean, are you kidding me? Give me a break with this crap. Like, and then is he buying off the national security state at all? Are they placated? Is the Washington Post and... and uh, and the New York Times and MSNBC, they're like, okay, he's definitely not a Russian agent. You know, come on. At this yeah. point, no. Um, nope, every escalation goes down the memory hole. Yeah, I'll tell you, man. Yeah, they, yeah, it doesn't do him any good. Doesn't, doesn't protect his right flank from them at all. But he shouldn't even need that anyway. You know? But, you know, on the, the positive note there is he's, you know, apparently working with Rand Paul. Sent Rand Paul to deliver a message to Putin which I don't know what that was, but I'm kind of, you know, hopeful about it, that maybe it said, hey, listen, screw all the haters and losers. What we're going to do is a giant nuke deal, and it's going to be very tremendous and terrific and classy and great and wealthy and awesome. And then why not, man? And then that's the deal. Just re reduce a bunch of nuclear arms, and nobody can say anything about that. Let them call that treason, seriously. And the American people won't buy it. Donald Trump will be like, look at how crazy these liberals are on their witch hunt, that they want to stop nuclear arms reduction agreements now. You people are insane. And the American people would go for that. The American people would go for, yep, they're even more insane than you. Hard to believe, but wow, what power he holds over them, you know, to drive them so nuts. But uh, yeah. I think they could try to oppose it. I think they would try to oppose it, and I think that they would go down in flames, and it'd be great. So... Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, Hopefully that's coming down the pipe. Yeah, you know, I kind of doubt it. Yeah, but no, I don't think so either. I like, to, I like to think of the outer limits of what could be possible under Trump if he just decided to do all of this. You know, just wear a bulletproof vest and, uh, and you know, go ahead and do the right thing. Which, you know, even a... Even just a mean old golfer can, who doesn't really know anything can know better than all of this crazy stuff. You know what I mean? I, I pick on the guy for not being smart enough, but anybody could know better than this. Anybody's dad, anybody's right-wing uncle could look at this now and go, you know what, we don't have to have any of these wars. We don't have to have a fight with Russia. We should get along with Russia. We should whatever. We don't have to have NATO even or even going that far. We, we don't have to have all this NATO expansion. We don't have to be in Eastern Europe, you know, sticking it right to the Russians when we you know, beat them fair and square back a long time ago. There's no point in rubbing their nose in it. What is all this? We wouldn't tolerate their expansion of their power in Latin America. We have our Monroe Doctrine, but we can't respect their own, you know? Um, yeah. Anybody could come up with that. You shouldn't have to be a left or right wing ideologue to realize this whole empire is bankrupt. I think Donald Trump, and that's the thing about the presidency, is he really could turn it all off. He really could. People say he couldn't. Yeah, he could too. He could, and he could fire any spies, and he could fire any generals who wouldn't go along with it till they were gone, and he got ones he liked. He could do it, you know. That's the the presidency is a really powerful office. You might have noticed, you yeah. know, James Ostrowski. I used to think that you know the the fact that Article Two was so brief 
that it really, you know, didn't that all legislative powers reside in the in the Congress, man, and that that sh- all these policies should be in the House of the People, if anything, not in the presidency. But it was James Ostrowski, uh, the great libertarian writer, who wrote an essay one time, I guess, for LewRockwell.com, about how powerful the presidency is. And boy, is it powerful. And boy, did he have a point in the way that he explained it. That, you know, in all that brevity and vagary is a, basically a bottomless writ of power, <laughs> you know? Uh there's really nothing they could do to stop them except remove them from office, and they're not going to remove them from office. They couldn't anyway. They couldn't get the votes to do it. And the and in the Republican districts, the people wouldn't let them. Not, I mean, maybe they would if they really had a good convincing trumped up charge, because there must be plenty that they could really, you know, if they want to get him for some crime. They're not going to remove him over anything. I don't think they'd even try over anything less than some real Russia treason, and they don't have any of that, obviously. Or it wouldn't have been this long. So, um, yeah, he really could get away with the full Ron Paul if he wanted to. He could just say, look, any soldier not on a plane out of Afghanistan by Thanksgiving, you're getting left behind. So, that's it. Last flight is Thanksgiving morning. So, pack up every last thing. We're really done. That's it. He could do that. He could do that. Um... I wish you would. That's what I would do. I think that's a uh, an unrealistic but optimistic note to end on for today. I think I, I think we'll stick that, stick with that. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, Scott, do you have anything to add before we we sign off? No, just thanks, Eric, for doing this. I would never record all these uh, interviewing myself, but it's nice to have you to talk to. Yeah, no, it's good. good. All right, and anyone who wants to uh, join up the um, the subreddit group, you can go to scotthorton.org/donate. And there's an option there to um, to sign up and just send us your Reddit handle and we'll get you in there. Yeah, man. Great. Thanks again. All right. Yep. Thanks. All right. Late.